Hey, listeners, especially those of you who live in the San Antonio area, you got to save the date. Mark the date, September 7th, 2023, a leadership conference with the theme, God and Country. Special speaker, General Jerry Boykin, September 7th, 2023. Visit leadtodaycommunity.com slash events to get your tickets today. Welcome to the Today Counts show. Today does count because it impacts, it influences your tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. The Today Counts podcast is sponsored by the generous donors of the Lead Today community. I'm your host, Kim Piper. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Today Counts show. I'm so glad that you are listening to this particular podcast. It is part six of six, entitled Timeless Wisdom for Diligent Leaders. Timeless Wisdom for Diligent Leaders. My source document is a New Testament scripture, almost 2,000 years old. It is written by a seasoned leader to a younger leader. And I'm going to, and specifically, we're looking at the sixth chapter of First Timothy. So that is the source document. Uh, and if if you have a Bible and would like to grab that, uh, that might be you know fun if if you're able to do that. And I've titled the guts of this this particular podcast six of six. Let's talk about money. Let's talk about money. And this is an overview of First Timothy chapter six. First of all, on the outset, I want to say that that I am surprised how few leadership talks, how few leadership presentations, keynotes address the issues surrounding money in a leader's life. I'm just a little bit surprised by it because who we are as people radiates and bleeds into our leadership. So I would think it would be a core subject that we would talk about more often. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about how to make more money. Plenty talk about that. Plenty of speakers talk about how to make more money. It's all over social media. I'm not talking about investing money. Plenty of people talk about that too. I'm not talking about spending money. Plenty of people talk about that and Marketing firms are all over us about that. But what I am talking about is being generous with money, being generous with our money, being generous people, people who think generously, people who have an outlook of generosity, people that think about blessing others. Yeah, so so that's what I want to talk about. Now, popular studies, now, this is interesting, I think. Popular studies reveal that there are multiple outcomes and benefits of generosity. Uh, Multiple outcomes and benefits for those who are generous. Uh, Here's just a short list. Generally speaking, there's an enhanced well-being. Enhanced well-being. Another is improved physical health. You heard that right. For those who live generously, there's enhanced well-being There's improved physical health. There's also stronger social connections. There is reduced stress and improved mental health. I want to say that again. When you become generous, it doesn't say if if you're rich and you're generous. It doesn't say if you're poor and you're generous. It simply says if you become a generous person, regardless of your situation, It reduces stress, and it improves mental health. Obviously, if you're generous, it also has a positive impact on others and our world. And then finally, when we become generous people, we usually become more purposeful people. We usually live with a deeper meaning, a higher meaning. In other words, generosity increases a sense of purpose and meaning. Now, let me be clear, though. We, we shouldn't give to get, right? We, you, you know that we shouldn't give so that we get, but that doesn't change the fact that that is how it works. 
when you give, you get. And if we give to get, we're probably not giving, but generosity. So it's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? We shouldn't give to get because that's probably not giving in the context and what we're talking about today. But it is interesting to look at the engineering of the creator in all of creation. It is more than a general truth that those who are generous, those who give tend to receive. I've heard it for years and years and years and years. You know, um, if God entrusts you with the ability to give, but you don't give, then he stops trusting you because you're damming up all of the resources. You're damming up all of the opportunities. But when you give, when you release the dam, then you can be trusted with the blessings and the resources that come from the supernatural. So we shouldn't give to get, but that is how it works. And every honest leader knows the difference between giving and giving generously. Every honest leader knows the difference between tipping, throwing in a few bucks, versus a conscious, willful giving that cost you, that cost you. So, in other words, generosity or generously is a big word. And obviously, I don't simply mean the number of letters found in the spelling of generously. It's a big word. It's a big word because it's a big idea. To be generous does not always mean that it's a big number, but it's always big to the person who gives generously. In other words, It's never about the equal sum. It's never about equal gifts. It's it's not about how much you gave versus what your neighbor gave. It's it's not about that. It's about equal sacrifice, equal sacrifice. Uh, Studies also show, the reason why I'm talking about this is because studies show, and it's not even a secret. You can uh, get on your search engine and just do a little bit of research. But studies find that the more many Americans have, the less that they give percentage-wise. And that's probably because they get memorized by the big check that they're writing, when in fact, in a percentage-wise, it is much less than what they once gave. But we shouldn't be looking at it that way. So let's talk about how to become the kind of leaders that we want to be, how to become generous leaders. And we're still going to stay right in the lane of generosity, of money, and of giving. The first thing that Paul teaches is that we need to intentionally develop a a sense of gratefulness, a practice of gratefulness. We need to develop contentment, contentment, gratefulness, and contentment. If you're grateful, It leads, it bleeds, it flows into a posture of content, contentment versus discontentment. Paul writes this in verses 6 through 8, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. True godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world. And we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So, if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Let us be content. When I read those verses, I get this sense of strength. Um, I get this level-headedness. I, I feel like wisdom is coming off the pages and, and, and peace. Um, I, I start. I start getting those kinds of things instead of this the striving. Now it's a proven fact. The more you consider what you have instead of what you don't, the more peace you experience. Contentment also breeds moderation. Contentment or discontentment, I should say. So contentment breeds moderation. Discontentment breeds anxiety. 
ask yourself this question when you are being blessed, when you are in a season of great profit and wealth, and it's flowing um, into, into your coffers. Ask yourself this, how much is enough? How much is enough? Typically, the more you own, the more you must earn to satisfy the needs of what you own. You understand that. The, the more you have, the more it wants, right? Because just about everything is depreciating. And if it's not depreciating financially, it's depreciating physically and needs attention and needs more attention, needs to be replaced, needs to be maintained, needs to be cared for, needs to be protected, needs to be insured. And frankly, how much can one person consume? Um, if you've got five really cool cars, how many of those can you drive at the same time? If you have 10 wonderful houses, how many of them can you be at at the same time, right? I, in some ways, I'm being facetious, yet I'm not, right? So step one into becoming a generous soul, a generous person, and therefore a generous leader is to work hard developing gratefulness and contentment. The second thing that Paul is teaching is to run from greed. Run from it. Run from greed. As soon as you kind of start sensing lust in your system and, and those, that, those constant desires that won't go away, run. Don't wrestle with it. Run away from greed. Verse 10 says it this way. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You've heard that before. Uh, it's, it's famous, right? For the love of money is the root, the root of all kinds of evil. I remember as a young man, um, I was doing extremely well in my career. And one day I was on the phone with my mom and, and she was sharing, you know, a lot of nice things with me over the phone. But she stopped at one point and she said, you know, Jim, what does concern me is that you might fall in love with money and that you might start pursuing the wrong things. And I pray this not to be true for you. You know, that struck me. That struck me because, you know, success and accomplishments was definitely, as a competitor, has always been on my heart and mind. And so when you work hard, you often reap the benefits of working hard. And, and with that comes money. But it's interesting how my mom was seeing something from a distance and whether what she was perceiving was true or not, she knew that this was a serious issue and had the courage to say it. It's funny. I'm not sure how old I was at the time. Let's say I was in my late 20s, and today I'm in my early 60s, and I remember that conversation as if it were yesterday. And he goes on, and he says, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows, many sorrows. You know, I, I think that, you know, just looking back over the decades of the people that I've known and the things, you know, we, we know that when couples fight, one of, the, one, one of the major items that they fight about is money. We know that when people compromise and get tempted to take shortcuts, it often has to do with money cheating on taxes, uh, stealing, making bad deals, uh, gambling, right? Investing, you're investing money that you can't afford to lose, but because of greed, you're, you know, you're hoping for a payday. You're taking a, a shortcut. Folks, this is greed. Those are all symptoms of greed. So if you're one of those that spends a lot of money on those slot machines or those blackjack tables or you're betting on sports, 
um, you know, I, or you're buying those lotto tickets and, and you start reviewing how much you're spending in those areas and it's no longer recreation, it's an addiction and it can pierce yourself. It can pierce you and your family. You can lose your relationships. You can lose trust. It can hurt so bad. And people even do it in their businesses where they cut corners. Um, they lie about contracts. They lie to their vendors and to their customers and to their employees. And in the end, it comes back to haunt you. Greed is dark. And when you sense it, run away, you know, get help. Um, make sure that you live in the light. Be in a place where it makes it difficult for you to cheat. So important. Money is not evil, but the love of money cultivates lust. And when does lust ever make your life better? When does lust ever make your home better? When does lust ever make our world a better place? Two things so far. Talking about money and how to become a generous leader. Develop gratefulness and contentment. Work hard at it. Make it your major. Lean into it. Number two, if you sense greed crouching at your door, smash it in the mouth and run. And three, learn to trust the giver, not the money. Don't trust the gift. Trust the giver. Trust the giver. He says this in verse 17. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. The gift is unreliable. The gift is temporary. The gift is a tool at the best, at best. It's not to be trusted, but instead their trust should be in God. God, who richly gets this, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Have you ever thought about this? You did not choose to be born, yet God chose to make you. God chose to give you life. It simply doesn't make sense that once you did not exist, but now you exist, that this person, this God, this creator who gave you life would then hold back on you. It doesn't make any sense. So we need to learn to trust the giver, not the gift. We need to learn to trust the giver, not the money. Sometimes we simply forget that God just doesn't have any shortages. There's nothing wrong with saving money. It's wise for a rainy day, as we say. But there does come a time where, we've already said it, how much is enough? How much can you spill over to help others? Sometimes, I'm repeating myself, but sometimes we simply forget that God has no shortages. He is the one who gave you your abilities. He gave you your moneymaker. <laughs> he gave you the ability to think, perform, create, manage, lead. Uh, he gave you those gifts. Trust the one who gave you the gifts. He is the one who provided the right relationships. Simply put, God's nature is giving. It's not taking. Darkness takes. Sin takes. Think of every sin you can think of right now. Go ahead and think about it. Think about it with me. Think about it with me. Think about it with me. Are you right? Now let's spill some of those things. Lying takes. Stealing takes. Cheating takes. Adultery takes. These things take. God gives, sin takes. So let's think about that. Let's think about, am I trusting the giver of the gifts or am I worshiping the gift? And just a quick review, how to become a generous leader, develop gratefulness, contentment, run from greed, run from lust, learn to trust the giver, not the gift, learn to trust the giver, not the money. Fourth and finally, have some stinking fun. Have fun with the money that you have made. Have fun blessing others. 
have fun solving problems, to giving to those who are in trouble, those that are in need. Give to those that are building something worth building, that are doing things that are important. In verse 17 to 19, Paul says it this way. Tell them, he's still talking to those of us who are wealthy, and if you are listening to this in America, who among us is not wealthy at some level, tell them to use their money to do good. I really like this sentence because it says use, use, not hoard. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. (laughs) I'm sure you caught it, but that was the gospel there in that last sentence. What we are doing right now in this life is we are laying a foundation for the next life. Here's the good news. Here's the really, really good news. There is life after our bodies die. And there is a new day coming, a new age coming. And by faith, we all take turns stepping from this reality into the next And this reality is about creating a good foundation of which to build in our next. So when you give, choose to give with joy. Choose to have fun. And when you give, give crazy. Give big. Give generously. And if you do, you will smile. You will laugh. And I want you to know this. God loves a cheerful gift. If you're not part of the Lead Today community, let me invite you. Go to leadtodaycommunity.com. That's leadtodaycommunity.com and sign up for Monday Moments. It's a weekly email that will encourage your leadership. Again, thank you for joining us today and thank you for telling a friend about the Today Counts show.